special task of anthropology is to uh, highlight the negation or inversion between familiar terms, ex a kind of disjunctive homonymity that can be resolved by formulation of novel worldviews, theoretical translations, and advancements. For this reason, when one of our, our board members, Holly High at the University of Sydney, mentioned that Jane Geyer wanted to retranslate the gift and distinguish between some crucial and motion term, which she shall illustrate soon, we embraced immediately this project. As Jonathan Perry, Thomas Stratman, and others have shown, most concepts of obligation or reciprocity or prestation require the scrutiny and ethnographic sensibility uh, the, same, the same required to translate notion as how, mana, or, or renda. So this project proved soon to be far more challenging than we expected. But we're here today, finally, and it's my pleasure to celebrate our third translation, English translation, of Mo's text in an expanded and critical edition. One of the magic that Hao has been able to perform was is to gather a, a num an incredible number of marvelous thinkers in the same issue or under the same roof as of today. How incredible that some of the greatest interlocutors of most are joining us. And I'm honestly in disbelief and incredibly grateful that they made this effort to, because for them also, uh, they haven't been discussing gifts for a while. So it was also a challenge to come back and here and gather together for us. And I think this is a, uh, an incredible uh, moment for uh, the history of anthropology too. But as, is, as we shall soon realize from the debate that will emerge the, in the next few hours, there is not really a free gift as there are no free beers. <laughs> How can succeed it out of the pro bono dedication of an editorial team and a community of reviewers and board members that had to find their sources of maintenance elsewhere. For this reason, I enjoy, invite you to enjoy this free event and all the work at how has been donating you through these years by, while thinking what you could do to ensure that the flow of the gifts continue. <laughs> One very small gesture would be to purchase what is currently a very low priced hard copy <laughs> on most classic text. If you can't find a hard copy, you will find a 20% discount code that, that will allow you to order a copy even for a lower price, that is $13.6 dollars, American dollars, directly from the University of Chicago Press, but only in the next seven days. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the Source Center of Ethnographic Theory and How Prime Event, the How of the Gift, the return and renewal of our foundational spirit Allow me to leave with most words in the conclusion of this essay, in the Geyer translation. We can and we should come back to the archaic, to its elements. We will rediscover the motives of life and action that are still known to numerous societies and classes. The joy of giving in public, the pleasure of generous artistic spending, that of hospitality and festivals. I give you the greatest gift giver of the day, Jane Geyer. Well, good afternoon. And thank you for, for coming and being interested here. Yes. Yes. I've got a couple of slides. Maybe while, while they fix the slides, I'm going to uh, share a personal thought with you on uh, the theme of partitioned observation and thought of motion. Maybe when I last thought of motion, which made me think, when was my first thought of motion? Here we go. 1950, the Ark Royal Camel Lair Shipyard, Birkenhead. All the school children were marshaled out of Waitwright for the then queen, eventually queen 
mother, who came to smash the champagne against the Ark Royal and to launch her off with the classic blessing. And so I looked up, in fact, online, uh, there is a, a, a little uh, film of that. So if you want to see a classic launching, look it up, Happy New online. Um, and it, there's a very interesting little commentary on the, the thoughts of the day in 1950. Uh, so there's, uh, there's the classic blessing for all who sail in her. That's all of us going forward. Uh, and then there's an appreciation for all of the shipyard workers who hammered rivers, put things together, built the docks, and so on, and the genius behind the, uh, the design. So, of course, our genius of the day is smashed on wood, and plenty of us who hammered away and put the, the rivets in and tried to create a new um, launching of this book. So, if you want to look up classic launching, it's on Happy News on the internet. Um, so, um, what I thought that I would first do, oh, well, before I even start on that, let me uh, explain to you why I put Kenty cloth up here. Ghanaian Kenty cloth. Um, many of us who are in African studies, we notice that Africa doesn't figure very strongly in the, uh, the essay on the gift. Um, but in the larger context, it does figure, and it figures very appreciatively in Moses' own voice. So I thought that just to bring in symbolically uh, for the few minutes that I have to explain the background uh, to doing this new translation, I thought that I would put up Kenty cloth and bring some. Okay, so I thought that I would start with an explanation of um, my own reason to take up this translation, and it really comes from discussions around a paper uh, that I had written for a conference in France that was organized by Keith Hart and Alain Cailly uh, several years ago. Uh, it was called Mos Vivant, the living most. Um, and of course I was immediately posed with the question of what I was going to write about in that regard. What particular theme uh, would I pick up? And this is uh, in appreciation of all of you who are students here, I picked up a theme from a student of mine, an Argentinian student, um, Andres Dapues, his name is, who had wanted several years ago to read the gift with me in French because he thought that in French he would appreciate it better than in English since both <coughs> French and English were foreign languages to him. So we searched in our uh, Johns Hopkins University Library for a French version, uh, the original French version, of the essay on the gift. And the only one that we found was in the journal collection, so in the original edition of uh, L'année sociologique, when it was relaunched in 1925 after the Great War. Um, um, this, of course, was Durkheim's journal. This is the journal that launched the whole French uh, school of sociology and anthropology. Um, and this was the edition. Uh, it was edited by Marcel Mauss himself, the whole, um, the whole edition, um, that relaunched the teaching publication of their particular group after, in fact, they had lost many of their junior people and their students in the war. Uh, they had been drafted and they had been lost as casualties. And we were very moved to find this. Let me do a comparison for you. I'm gonna unwrap this gift from its Kenty cloth. And I'll explain the particular wrapping in a minute. So this is the original. This is it. The first edition of L'année sociologique after the Great War. This was my first uh, copy of the gift that I bought in 1965 when I graduated from the LSE undergraduate. This is, uh, this is Conniston's translation, so you see the difference. <laughs> right? Uh, so this was the comparison that I was thinking about. I was thinking, my goodness, what, what was the context in which uh, this uh, was published? 
Um, and of course, Durkheim himself had died in the meantime. Um, in part, people always suggest because of grief at the loss of his son, who was a casualty uh, of the Great War. And so I decided to write my paper for the conference on, on this instead of this to see what I could do with it. And um, I was very particularly moved, and the people at the conference were encouraging to me, especially Keith, who is here, um, at the sequence of the thinking. At the end of the memorial to all of these people who had been killed in the war, um, and I'll show you a slide of the devastation that that war was to remind ourselves. These are the last words of the memorial. The sap will rise again. Another seed will fall and germinate. It is in this spirit of faithful memory to Durkheim and to all our dead. It is in continuing communion with them. It is in sharing their conviction of the usefulness of our science. It is in being nourished like them by the hope that man is perfectible through it. It is in these sentiments held in common amongst us beyond death that we take up again strongly with heart the task we have never abandoned, namely a new, a new era of sociology, social anthropology. Um, and it's in this context that I felt very convinced that most turn to the other peoples of the world for inspiration in all their variety. Uh, in his own era, and maybe in our own era, we, um, when in his era people remembered, in our own era we have only very vague memories of what a catastrophe World War I was. Um, there may be some of us, well, like me, whose own grandfathers fought in that war, and I remember my grandfather talking about being at the front in that war. Um, but I thought that I would show you the numbers so that we would share what went on there. Look at these casualties. It's absolutely catastrophic. And you can see very particularly that the French um, were particularly subject to devastation. About three quarters of the men mobilized <coughs> ended up as casualties in that war. So you could imagine, I, I began to imagine moving from the end of the memorial into the beginning of the essay on the gift, the, the, that sense that, that most, I felt sure, must have had, that there is elsewhere in the world that one can find inspiration. Our own civil, so-called civilization, we'll get to this later on, um, has produced something so catastrophic that we are going to try to move on. So then we turn the page to the essay on the gift, uh, which ends, and here I excerpt from the last page. Thus the clan, the tribe, and the peoples have learned, as tomorrow in our so-called civilized world, classes and nations and individuals too will have to learn how to confront one another without massacring each other. We can also see how this concrete study can lead not only to a science of customs, but even to civility and the various aesthetic, moral, religious, and economic motives, and the diverse material and demographic factors, which to the, together create a foundation for society and constitute a life in common. So although when we read it separately like this, to our great inspiration, um, we do get that message, it's translated, but I think the sheer import of it uh, is strengthened by connecting it to that moment in history and to the memorial that, uh, that Moos was, uh, was writing before moving in to the essay on the gift. Uh, so I decided to write my paper for Keith and Alan's conference on this whole, this whole thing, as far as I could um, master the parts of it that are written by Moos, uh, the memorial, the essay on the gift, and 80 of the book reviews. So here, I, I wrapped it in color so you could see. This black is the memorial. This is the gift, red, in 
in line with his own political convictions. This green is the sap rising again. This is him and his colleagues engaging with the uh, European scholarship in the social sciences in the immediate post-war period when so many were engaged with the questions of how to reconstitute and move forward into a different social world. So um, it was having written that paper that, um, that I then received suggestions by others who had read these, these versions and the W.D. Hall's version, both of which are very important translations. There was several people who said to me, we didn't know that. We didn't know that it was published in that way. Couldn't we do a new translation that included some of that, that repositioned the essay on the gift in this context? After this, in the recuperation phase uh, from this, um, um, Keith, Alain, Wendy James, and uh, Holly High in another uh, context, all <coughs> suggesting to me that, that an English language text that included at least some of that context could be very helpful to us in thinking forward in the applicability of the ideas and the, the relevance of the essay on the gift to the future. And uh, let me show you what I decided that the whole needed to look like. And I'll go into a couple of these details later on. Um, this page in the middle is to, sh to show to you how it was written by Moose in the original, and that is that the, what are now endnotes in our, um, our English original were then footnotes. So this is how the whole thing would look. Memorial, the essay on the gift with footnotes at the foot of the page, and then reviews. Um, I think we've lost a, uh, a small part of that, but about 80 of those reviews were written by Moose himself, reviews of other work in the European intellectual community. Okay, so back to our shipbuilding here. Uh, Giovanni was, uh, was very encouraging to do this through uh, Howe uh, as an open access contribution. And so with all of these people leaning on me, saying, come on, let's do it, uh, I decided to take it up and I added uh, these two further features. Be besides translating the memorial and some of the reviews by Moos himself, his own reviews, particularly of works that he cited in the text of the, the essay on the gift and more philosophical um, discussions of works that were analyzing, for example, the place of religion in, in modern Western life. Um, so in addition to those inclusions, that's what the expansion is about, the expanded edition, um, I added two things. I put the footnotes at the bottom of the page rather than as end notes so that the reader can go back and forth if they want to, if, if that's interesting to them, or just to be impressed by the sheer volume of the scholarship that went into this work. The, the ways in which most was, was sounding out this vast uh, body of ethnographic work and taking all of the cases so seriously in people's own words. So when you see this new edition, you too will be going back and forth from the text to the footnotes if you want to do that. You don't have to. You can sail across in the big pr print at the top of the page, but you can also glance down and say, what? What was that about? Who wrote that particular ethnography? Even the page numbers, I mean, the editorial effort, the, sh the sheer, um, must have been 24-7 effort that went into this, um, are very evident when you can see the footnotes at the bottom of the page. So then, secondly, the other change uh, that I, uh, I made over the, um, the editions that we have already is to note what some of the words were in French. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, most is, in fact, using four different words that could be translated uh, into English as gift. So um, we have prison, which I've just kept as present, uh, cadeau, don, and prestation. We'll go into that in a minute. Um, and he's using all of those words in a way that is never defined by him why he's using one versus the other. He's using a rich vocabulary in order to, it seemed to me, to encompass uh, a richness of practice and ideas and ideologies of exchange. Um, and he himself says the terms we have used, present, gift, don't, are not themselves altogether exact. We simply cannot find others, that's all. Uh, so now that we have the digital um, means of, uh, of counting up, uh, I counted up the, um, the ways in which don, cadeau, prestation, présent are used in his text. And it does have this extraordinary musical quality, it seemed to me. There's a crescendo and a diminuendo going into the ways in which the terminology is used. Don is used relatively infrequently in the beginning, even though, of course, that's the title, Essay sur le don. Um, but by the end, it's, it's much higher profile. Cadeau, which is much more frequent in the beginning, is falling. Prestation, which has a certain kind of, uh, of, of uh, status quality to it, um, is somewhat less frequent, falling a little bit, and présent is just there, on and off, uh, as, I suppose, as a as recourse in uh, making a particular point that doesn't have a very strong theoretical uh, or ideological uh, claim uh, to it. But this is something that maybe all of us will perhaps look at um, as we as we examine this text as it was written with the richness of the vocabulary in French and the richness of the allusion in the footnotes to people's own terms uh, for these exchanges. So, um, so doing this work has been a real inspiration for me and I was grateful for the friends and colleagues who were leaning on me to do it. Um, I felt that I was in a certain conversation with uh, Moose himself and with, with the group that he was part of since he was uh, alluding to their work throughout. Um, but I think that uh, I want to um, move very quickly to the end of these thoughts to mention um, some of the people who have been very particularly prominent in um, being part of the shipbuilding team, working in the docks here. Of course, uh, Giovanni Dacol has been very important. Sean Dowdy, who is uh, editor, who is in Chicago at the moment, right? Yes? Yes. Um, Elisa, is Elisa here? No. Um, who in Birmingham started to help me look up um, quotes that most himself had translated from, from English. There are certain um, interpretive dimensions to Moses' own use of the English sources when he puts them uh, into French. And so we had to decide, shall we put them back into the original English or shall we retranslate Moses' interpretation? And for the most part, in the end, we tried to put them back into the original English. Um, Justin Dyer continued that task. And then... Um, there was a, an editor who helped me with the French translation, editing, Matthew Carey. Is he here? I don't know who's here. No. Um, but there were m many others who put in very important work in just the creation, the building of this particular text. Uh, and then, of course, Bill Morrow, who wrote the foreword. Um, and then, of course, Keith Hart, David Graeber, Maurice Godelier, and Alain Caillé, who added their endorsements uh, on the cover. 
So then you too, as readers, will continue the critiques and the engagements with this text, carrying it forward, steaming on. We're in the launching mode again now, steaming on, taking the inspiration in yet new directions of your own, as I'm sure most intended. The sap will rise yet again. So um, I end with, um, with one comment that is, um, is inspired by the occasion of the launch of the Center for Ethnographic Theory um, here uh, at SOAS. Um, Bill Morrow mentioned in his um, foreword that everybody has their favorite footnote from the essay on the gift. And he, and he quoted Keith as having a favorite footnote, having written somewhere that he had a favorite footnote. There you go. So perhaps everybody in the room has their favorite footnote. But m one of my favorite sentences is in the text. And it's probably one that we just float by most of the time. But I thought it was inspirational for uh, for how itself, uh, as a journal of ethnographic theory. Um, and of course, the first inspiration for this came, as I understand, from Marshall Salins, and it was certainly embodied in the lecture from uh, yesterday. Um, and it will be embodied in the Center for Ethnographic Theory. So this is on page 114 of the new edition. It's very short. Le point de départ est ailleurs. The point of departure lies elsewhere. I put lies in order to say the lay of the land. Make a trip, make the journey, go there. And this seems to me that this is fundamental to an ethnographic approach in anthropology. The point of departure lies elsewhere. And Moose is saying this in the context of, um, of a critique of what he calls our so-called civilized stand, standpoint, our self-styled standpoint of thinking of ourselves as the context in which civilization has developed. Um, this is the context in which that sentence appears. He wrote, current economic and juridical history is enormously mistaken on this point, that is that time-framed contractual arrangements are original to modernity or civilization. Uh, he says, imbued with modern ideas, it makes up, this is, this is the modern, modern uh, theory, makes up a priori ideas about evolution, as if from a superior phase of civilization. In fact, he says, the point of departure lies elsewhere in Le Don. And Another thing that I discovered and I hadn't realized before, um, that his essay, it's titled Essay on the Gift, Essay sur le don. Essay is also in French an assay, assay in the sense of testing out on a, a, a sample. And he, in fact, uses the term, uh, the, the word fragment, fragment, quite often in his argument. So what he's suggesting there is that this is a beginning, his own engagement with this ethnographic corpus, which can get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, is a beginning, an exploration, a start on a fragment of what will be a much bigger topic and much more important than our, quotes, modern um, uh, civilization has thought up to now. So uh, I thought le point de départ est ailleurs is a foundational assumption for our inspiration in anthropology and one that has been taken forward by How Journal, How Books, and this new center that we're launching here. So I hope that this new and expanded edition of the gift can make its own contribution to the realization of this conviction as we launch it out into the turbulent waters of another theoretical, world political, and technological era. 
with its own tensions 90 years after the original. And as if by total happenstance, this morning I got an email saying there's a, a new book on the fourth industrial revolution, suggesting that we're gonna be in the era of robotics and genomics and so on and so forth, a totally different moment in economic life. Can we take the essay on the gift, its inspiration, its engagement with the tragedies of the world and the hope for the future? Can we take that into this new era uh, that we seem to be moving into? So um, my thanks in advance to all the speakers uh, who constitute, I decided as I was thinking back to launching, they must constitute the first officers of the, of the boat, right? <laughs> Captain, first mate, the person who's going to make the engine work and so on and so forth. And then the rest of us passengers who are going to be inspired to take different journeys into these new and turbulent uh, waters. So it seems to me that this is the moment to turn over to those who are going to navigate us out of this harbor and into the choppy waters of the present world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a two minute break. So if you have a, a pressing need, there's toilets at the end of the corridor. We'll quickly rearrange the stage here and I would ask our panelists to please join me on stage. Thank you. Minions, on stage please. No, 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 no. Chair. Water for each person, five people, come on. The water is there just a second, there's some over there. Water, glasses for five speakers. David.
Good afternoon. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm a lecturer in anthropology with reference to Japan here at SOAS, and I'm honored to be chairing the first panel today. Now, the chair's task is twofold to introduce the speakers who really do not need any introduction at all, and then to tell these same people to hold their peace after the allotted amount of time has passed. So no heckling. Uh, you will have a chance to air your views uh, during the discussion at the end of the first and again at the end of the second panel. To boldly go where no man has gone before, to explore new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, these are not only the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, but they also describe the intellectual trajectory of our first speaker. More than anyone else, she has shaped the way anthropologists think about gender relations and the particular social matrices they give rise to. Her gift to anthropology is an ethos of questioning the most basic assumptions that underlie our theorizing, both everyday and academic, about exchange, kinship, reproduction, and feminism. Her gift to anthropology lecturers is her most well-known book, the gender of the gift, a text so brilliantly complex and startlingly innovative that it is used all over the world to make undergraduate brains bleed. <laughs> the ones who get the point after reading it uh, generally sprout wings, the other self-combust, <laughs> which makes the exam process uh, much more straightforward. She's a fellow of the British Academy. She was the William Wise Professor of Social Anthropology in Cambridge. She was the mistress of Girton College, and she was made the Dame Commander of the British Empire for services rendered to social anthropology in 2001. Please give it up for Professor Marilyn Turn. <laughs> Thank you for that. And Jane, thank you for your words. I'm going to use first names, if I may. And I shall tell you in a moment of a rather special reason to be thanking you. This is an inspirational moment for how, and if I may say, for the Center for Ethnographic Theory at SOAS. Giovanni has just reminded us of Howe's stirring rubric and its recall of the days when anthropology gave concepts to the world, such as taboo, and Mana, not so, not so far off from the days when Most was writing. Interestingly, however, what Most did was take a concept, gift-giving, as thoroughly evident from his own world as it was to be found everywhere else. There was an inquiry to be made into the conditions of contract and exchange wherever the law of things connects to the law of persons. Indeed, without treating the whole range of his material seriously, unfamiliar or familiar, he could not, could not have mounted a political commentary of any purchase. One consequence, of course, is that the concept of gift giving seems everywhere. It certainly doesn't belong to sociology and certainly not to anthropology. Across the arts and humanities, of course, and outside academia altogether, it flourishes with its own momentum. So anthropologists should not be too dazzled by the way it travels in our midst, cropping up in issues to do with charity, with corruption, with inheritance taxes, with the ethics of so open source software and so forth. What is dazzling is something else, the way Marcel Mauss travels, the way it's his name that is so, is so often on, so often attached to, discussions of gift giving. Thus a professor of medical ethics writing on property in the body, who could perfectly well have kept with the passionate argument for blood donation that Titmus made in his book, The Gift Relationship, feels compelled to cite Mose as the classical text. And there it is. Amidst all the references to DNA samples, the UK Biobank, and World Health Organizational Guidelines, in the words of its second translation, 
the form and reason for exchange in archaic societies. And it's with most in mind, this medical ethicist suggests, that a French jurist has been marshalling arguments against the French's, French state's absolute insistence on the irrevocable alienability of the gift in organ transplantation. <laughs> if he'd had the benefit of Jane's title, we would also have encountered the gift, the form and sense of exchange in archaic societies as the very title of an installation by the New Zealand artist Michael Stevenson. Wanting to engage art collectors, in this case in Germany, with the concept of reciprocity, he staged his installation with this title through numerous transactions that meant they were caught up in various giving and receiving relationships with him. The focus through which he channeled their attention was a replica of a wartime raft from which an impoverished artist had years ago been saved. His press release quotes Moos on Malinowski, a passage about the recipient's commitment to make a return gift, and a review of one of Stevenson's traveling um, exhibitions at the Herbert Reed Gallery says that among the exhibits was a vitrine stocked with relics, and inside was a copy of Moos's anthropological study and the review spells it out, the gift, the form and reason for exchange in archaic societies. Now I'll come back in a moment as to why I'm particularly happy that the word archaic is there. Because at first sight, it seems a bit awkward. Now nearer home in the humanities, one might have some expectation of encountering Moses' traveling name. One could include an academic lawyer here, referring to the gift, the gift culture of research scholarship, who does not just cite Moos, but draws on the connection Moos himself made between literary works and the author's enduring interest in them. Moos was talking about the then recent shifts in French intellectual property law and the belated recognition of the person in the thing. Not so surprising then that a professor of Victorian literature writing on me mementos and collectibles as ambiguously at once fungible objects and ineffable relics should turn to anthropology and who should be leading in the small cast but most. That said, the Victorianist specifically argues against the idea that this ambiguity was a residue of an archaic gift impulse rather than being understood as part of capitalism's success. Indeed, anthropologist friend in history and comparative literature, Natalie Zeman Davis, made a similar comment apropos the political significance of gifts in 16th century France. Most is there, of course, on her very first page, again leading in a number of anthropologists, although they are, in her view, by no means the only scholars to have implied that gift exchange inevitably gives way before the market. Recent work, she says, has since made the gift landscape much more open. However, the anthropologist has to get really close to home, to contemporary sociology, to find the objection to archaism being made vehemently, I would even say nastily. David Cheel, in his version of the gift economy, is withering in his dismissal of most anthropological work, and heading the queue, once more, of course, is Moos. Cheel's problem is that he wants to reinstate the gift, he, Cheel, that is, to reinstate the gift as indicative of a moral economy symbolizing the central values of a love culture based on the free and choiceful disposition of objects. And Moos's sin was to maintain, I quote, that the study of the gift involved a return to the old and elemental. Most happily, our new translation suggests that Most wrote something closer to, we can and should come back to the archaic, to its elements. Not quite the same. But all the same, archaic. Well, I'm glad that Most referred to archaic societies 
and that Jane has kept the title that way. Of course, from today's hindsight, we can read archaic, ironically, in a way I'm sure most himself never meant. Nevertheless, what the, effort, what the epithet wonderfully does is bring a huge elephant into the room. In fact, it creates an elephant in the room. If there is the faintest hint that there might be something of interest to present circumstances in the form and sense of exchange in archaic societies, then archaic can only be read ironically. I mean, they have never been archaic. This is said another way in the English term itself. Now, I've no idea if any of you would agree, but to me the epithet sounds a bit different from primitive or antiquated or outmoded. Itself slightly archaic, it makes one sit up. Archaic carries the resonance of something that is characteristic of an earlier period, so no longer current, but nonetheless a style that once had its own integrity. I'm not defending the temporality implied, but rather the hint all over again that there might be elements from possibilities beyond our horizons to which it would be good to attend. And this, of course, was the moment, of, of, uh, it was the conclusion of what Jane has just been talking about. The point is an old one precisely because it recurs. I mean, the old goes on coming back because it needs to be there with us each new day. So why, dazzling as they are, those examples I gave of Moses' name being brought in all over the place? Sometimes his name travels alone. Sometimes it brings in its trail other anthropologists. Perhaps it's too optimistic to imagine that the invocation of Moses' name beyond anthropology carries a gesture, <coughs> however uninformed, towards anthropological sources of knowledge in peoples everywhere as though there were larger truths, even if one does not go there oneself, that anthropology might hold. An awkward hope for anthropologists to respond adequately, of course. But this is one of the places where the new translation will have its impact. I was deeply moved by the contextualization of the essay on the gift. And there is more, of course, as the projet most people have been telling us for years. Precisely as a memorial should do, this contextualization makes one think of a larger world beyond the immediate horizon, not something one can do alone. I've indicated a few places where beyond anthropology, people have found in anthropology something of a larger world to which they would no doubt aspire to be part of or else dramatically get rid of. We can glimpse our discipline as momentarily on the horizons of others. The actual examples are rather small in the bigger order of things, but they make the structural point. We might find illumination not only by forever worrying at the perspective anthropology has on the world, but also appreciating how, for well or ill, others have perspectives on anthropology, a gesture towards a wider world contained in the gesture towards most. And that exchange of perspectives is something we might listen to more closely if we attend to its dynamic as an explicitly enacted element of some forms of gift exchange. For all that, in its work of detachment, the gift has the contours of the commodity, whether in the French jurist's vision of effective alienation or as a precursor to the utility of trade, the gift that compels a return compels an exchange of perspectives that is not quite captured in the usual vernacular notions about the endless points of view that we all have on one another. The new translation is not just another point of view. It surely arises from a literary counterpart to the exchange of perspectives, although the translator has to act roles as it were, as both donor and recipient at once. For it's only by seeing the text as it is, taking from both the form and sense of it, 
that the translator can produce its counterpart and give back to the original a version of itself from another world. Jane, you've animated this extraordinary work. You've made us think again of the form and sense in which anthropological knowledge circulates. Now, I know you wouldn't want me to wish that your name travels alongside Moses and he will continue to do his work for us all, but I secretly hope that it will. The gift that makes us think never outruns its gifts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second speaker on this glorious afternoon is none other than Professor Marshall Salins, known to his ex-students and colleagues simply as MDS, D clearly standing for defiant. Professor Salins ethnographic work on the Pacific, his contributions to anthropological theory and historical anthropology are well known to all of us. The debates that his work caused among scholars about the death of Captain Cook about the relative abundance in so-called primitive societies, about the danger of homo economicus, is the stuff that today's classroom discussions are made on. Never satisfied to be confined to the ivory tower, Professor Salins in many ways is the model for anthropological activism. During the protests against the Vietnam War, he invented the teach-in, a creative form of academic resistance to the status quo. When sociobiology emerged in the late 70s, he proved to be a staunch defender of the human condition versus the newly invigorated idea of human nature, championed by evolutionary psychologists, for example. More recently, he has been involved in a debate about the presence of the Confucius Institute on campus. Well, hosting a propaganda institution on campus? Who would do such a thing? <laughs> well, the answer is we do, uh, but you all know about that. Preceded by his reputation as an intellectual giant, for the second day in a row, all the way from Chicago, Illinois, please welcome Professor Marshall Salins. Thank you very much. I didn't really prepare a paper, uh, but it's, I want to talk about something that's been bothering me for 47 years, uh, uh, which is relevant to uh, the name of our, uh, our hallowed institution, How, namely, what is How, and uh, what is uh, meant by this famous uh, text which introduces uh, the, uh, the gift, the, the text from the Maori sage uh, Ranapiri. Uh, I don't know when most put this in the text. Uh, he said he got it from Davi and uh, somebody else that I recall. But in any case, it seems to be curiously uh, out of touch with some other parts of the text. And I would like to sort of just go through the, the problem. Most says that this is an imprecise text. Uh, you might recall what happens is A gives a, a, a gift, we'll call it that for the moment, to B, who, <coughs> who passes this on to C, who gives back some other thing to B, which, um, which most says it must be obligatorily returned to A because it is the how of the gift that A gave to B. Uh, this is the only place in the text, as I can recall, where there are three parties that are necessary to talk about reciprocity. So I think that something else is obviously going on. Going on. When I say that uh, most said it's imprecise, he is, uh, in the first place, he, and I'm afraid all the translations have also been somewhat imprecise. Uh, for one thing, he says, <coughs> It is clear that the bond of law in Maori, the bond occurring between things is one of souls, because the thing itself has a soul, is of the soul. <clears throat> and what he's talking about is says, first of all, we we, we're talking about something called a taonga in Maori, which is cognate to the Samoan uh, valuable mats. 
and which is a valuable, quite unlike any ordinary good. Unfortunately, in the original translation in English, uh, following closely in the French where most calls it an article déterminé, and which uh, <coughs> Jane rightly translates as a certain article. There's also a parenthesis, taonga, which means that it's not an ordinary article. And we can't treat the, the discussion between A, B, and C as three individuals exchanging some ordinary article. It has the soul of the clan. It itself has an animated being. And in fact, it subsumes the being of the donor rather than representing the being of the donor. And most says of these kinds of gifts that precisely they are productive. <clears throat> that is to say, they bring life uh, through uh, their transactions. Uh, and he gives uh, later on in the text, uh, when he's talking about Kwakutl and Tlingit on the Northwest Coast, a distinction between exchanging ordinary things, which in fact I, he doesn't even consider to be reciprocally required, uh, returned, and exchanging treasure, which is what this is. Um, now, in, uh, in the one translation that I know, a recent translation is called a valuable rather than a determined article or a certain article. <coughs> uh, the word how, uh, it seems to me, means the increase on the gift that is due to the spirit of, that is in the gift, that is the spirit of the clan, etc., and the ancestor, which is a productive spirit. The, the causative in Maori, whakahau, means to inspire, to command, to initiate. The gift is what is, the, the gift as it goes from B to C is what has been commanded by the gift from A to B, what has been initiated, which is an increase in value. Uh, and it's due, I, of course, uh, I mean, I made this argument 47 years ago, but without the proper animism. The proper animism, it seems to me, is that the gift itself is what is animated by, a pers by, uh, by human power. It is not necessarily the power of the donor. In the case of a valuable, we're not even talking in this text of chiefs who might claim to have uh, a certain priority with regard to ancestral goods. We're talking about any particular people quite anonymously uh, identified. In that case, it's not, as he wants to say in the next sentence, <clears throat> from this it follows that to present something to someone is to present something of oneself. In the case of valuables, the, the person is actually included in the gift itself that is the person of the gift because he's a member of the clan of the Hapu uh, of which this gift is an ancestral form. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, we have to understand how the how as the productive quality of the gift due to its animistic properties derived from the ancestors and the gods, which is what he says about Kwakutl and so on, maybe a hundred pages later. That being the case, uh, how is a justifiable notion for this center <laughs> and this enterprise of, of uh, Giovanni's and company? It is a productive in its own right. Giovanni, I guess, is the ancestral form uh, <laughs> who has brought us all together to produce something beyond uh, what we do individually, as this gift did, something beyond the individuals who, in fact, were cited in, the, in this text. Uh, that's about all I have to say, except for one thing, I guess. Uh, this melange that uh, most does between the individual soul of the giver and the, and the clan spirit in the gift seems to me a kind of imprecision that runs through uh, maybe French anthropology of that period, I don't know. Durkheim was always interested in contagion. Most is interested in the melange of total prestation, which I think is a very rare 
quality uh, total prostation. I think it actually happens only in uh, exogamous moieties, uh, that most gifts are not so total as, uh, as, uh, as, as implied. Uh, so I think that uh, there's a lack, there's a certain lack of precision. I don't know. I didn't. We didn't come here to criticize uh, most, so I won't go on. But uh, it's something to consider. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. It is very rare in London that somebody comes up to you on the tube and says. I approve of your reading matter. This happened to me not once, but twice, when reading our next speaker's opus magnum, Debt, the first 5,000 years. Similar in scope and breadth to the gift, it addresses not only many of the core questions of economic anthropology with great erudition, but has also become something of an activist bible for the Occupy Wall Street movement, a leading figure of which our next speaker has become. A student of Professor Salins at Chicago, his first position was at Yale, and we have to be eternally grateful to the reactionary forces at Yale that <laughs> propelled him over the Atlantic, <laughs> first to Goldsmith and later on to his present position at the LSE. Word on the street is that the LSE is far too circumspect to let him anywhere near their undergraduates in case such an encounter could trigger an accidental revolution. All the better for us here at SOAS. Please give a warm welcome to Professor David Graeber. Well, is this working? Yeah. Um, Giovanni asked me to talk about the ongoing importance of, of Moses' gift. So I thought I'd say a few words about that, um, both in the positive and, and the negative sense. Um, I mean, say we're not here to critique most, but we should do a little. You know. um, I mean, it, most of this book is, has been so influential in so many different ways, it, it can't help but have had you know, profoundly positive and, and profoundly confusing effects. Um, it's, it's sort of, a, a book which launched uh, a thousand intellectual projects. Um, so I think that you know probably the weakest thing about the book is the title, the gift. Um, the fact that that it you know has framed the gift as the great problem of anthropology has been a little confusing because the gift is essentially a negative catch-all category for anything that isn't a commodity relation. Um, so the assumption that all forms of transaction that are not commodity transactions based on economic self-interested calculation are somehow the same, um, why do we assume that? There's no particular reason why that should be the case, and, and I don't think it actually is. Um, so in, and, and second of all, one thing that's been rather confusing about the book, I think, has been, don't worry, I'm gonna get to the good stuff soon. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that, that, that's, I think, been a little confusing about the book is, is that, it also encourages us when we do think about the gift as if it were simply one thing unifying all of these different forms of, of non-commodity transaction um, is that it's sort of modeled on, on the heroic gift that you know, the sort of most magnificent aristocratic forms of gift giving are the paradigmatic form. Um, it's very interesting at some point at the end of, of, of the book he actually comes up with a almost Gramscian theory of how the sort of most characteristic mode of transaction of the dominant class of a per particular era becomes their definition of humanity itself. Uh, it's not much observed, but he points out that it takes a long time before the idea of, of economic calculation in the current, um, as we now conceive to be universal in economics, existed for a long period of time, but it just never occurred to anybody that this is a defining feature of humanity. Uh, it was a something certain people did in certain contexts, and it's only quite recently that it became so that in the sort of domi dominant or most characteristic mode of the most of, of the dominant class sort of becomes projected as our model of humanity. Um, in earlier stages, um, you know, it's say the aristocratic gift, which is again not what aristocrats did all the time, but what they thought of as their most characteristic mode of transaction becomes the model for humanity. And in, in a way, people have read this, uh, taken this book rather rather confusedly to, to make it so. Um, 
partly because the, the aristocratic gift has, has so much drama intensity um, and, and human mystery packed into it. Um, whenever I teach the gift, I always give the example of um, most work, this very, very short um, little piece. It was a commentary on the Greek author Posidonius uh, in somewhere in Anne Sociologique. Uh, um, it was like a three-page commentary, but I think it packs a lot into it. Um, Posidonius was observing Celtic nobles and the sort of festivals they had, and they would engage in all these contests, poetry contests and duels, and they would get engage in gift-giving contests. Uh, and, and every now and then, when in the midst of these contests, one, of, one player was basically checkmated and received a gift so huge he couldn't possibly return it, um, the only appropriate thing for him to do would be to commit suicide and then distribute the, the, the pieces of, of, of the overwhelming gift to his followers. And this is the sort of ultimate uh, <laughs> reply to someone who, who, who checkmated you. It's the only honorable thing to do. We were thinking about this and, and comparing it to a piece I read in um, a Viking, about Vikings in one of the Icelandic sagas that um, were two Vikings, a story, Einar and Egil, if I remember. Um, one was sort of semi-retired Viking, and the other one was still doing raids. And they were both, they were also poets. Um, and um, they liked to sit around writing poetry together. Um, one day, I think Einar was the name of the younger one, came to visit Egil. Egil was out, so he left him a gift, this beautiful shield, this magnificent object that you know, no one had ever seen anything like it. It was covered with mysterious writing and jewels, and um, left it hanging from the rafters, went off about four hours later, um, Yegil comes home and says, my God, what's that? And uh, the thralls all say, well, you know, it's your friend. Um, Einar came over and gave it to you, said it was a present. So he looks at it and said, oh, so I suppose he now expects me to write some sort of a poem celebrating his generosity. To hell of it, I'll kill him. Um, <laughs> so he gets on his horse and rides after him. He can't catch up and the sun goes down. He says, Damn, okay, fine, I'll write a praise poem. <laughs> um, so, you know, it sort of brings home everything that can be at stake in a gift. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But you know, as a result, these, these things draw you in, and, and they do seem to show something intense about human nature. But um, as a result of this, um, I think we get lost as to, you know, there are many, many different sorts of things going on that get collapsed together. I myself tried to disentangle them, and the above mentioned book uh, on debt, um, that you, know, you have this sort of communistic relations where you just give to people because you assume that they would do the same, which is the basis of all sociability is just sort of the, the, um, the sort of communistic gift. I call it baseline communism. Um, and this is actually an idea that comes from most, most himself, not in the gift, but in other, um, in his ethnographic lectures. Actually, he said that, you know, the mistake is to assume that communism and individualism are opposed principles. Actually, uh, communism can be the basis of individualism. Um, you can have individualistic communism, a relationship with two people who are just communist with each other, but not with anybody else. Um, and, and these kind of like networks of individualistic communism actually are the sort of bedrock of society. Um, and you know, an exchange, the gift, gift exchange, of the, which can turn into this heroic competitive form, is a very particular form, which is actually in many ways much more analogous to commercial exchange than either of the other things that get classified as gifts. And then you have hierarchical gifts, um, which defy the logic of reciprocity entirely. In fact, they're the opposite. They're based on the logic of precedent. If you give a gift to someone who's clearly an underling or a superior, rather than they're feeling obliged to reciprocate, they'll, they'll expect you to do it again. Um, the a gift becomes a precedent. Um, so you know, a lot of this becomes obscured because of the emphasis on the heroic gift. So OK, that I think is uh, the title thus, uh, therefore, is the weakest part of the book uh, uh, and its ongoing legacy. On the other hand, um, it's also true that the book was written in a hurry for a very particular reason. It wasn't a book, it was an essay. And, and Moe himself said, you know, I, I put off writing this just like he put off writing all those books that he actually wanted to write uh, because we're just not quite ready yet. We don't have enough data um, to really resolve these questions, uh, which he, according to him, was a, a ongoing investigation into the origins of the notion of contractual obligation. That's what the book was actually supposed to, uh, the ongoing research project was actually about. But the reason why he published it was actually political. Um, in effect, the book was his response to Lenin's new economic policy. Most people don't know this. Um, he was, you know, uh, 
very ambivalent about the Russian Revolution. He was himself a revolutionary cooperativist. He, he um, helped or he ran a cooperative bakery in, in Paris um, and used to go off on, he never did any ethnographic field work, but he did a lot of cooperative field work. He would go off and sort of study the cooperative system in different countries, try to link up producer and consumer co-ops. And, um, and um, you know, he, so during the Russian Revolution, he was like he wrote that you know on the one hand, you know these are my ideas as a socialist being put into practice. On the other hand, I can't stand these guys and the way they're going about it. The fact that they were like killing off the cooperatives didn't help. You know, help. Um, and um, he. And then what, what really got him was that they couldn't just simply abolish the market. You know, if Lenin first tried to simply institutionalize a non-market society, it didn't really work, and he went back with a new economic policy, reintroduced the market, and most sort of sat down and said, well, we need to rethink these things. What is it about the market we really have a problem with? What is it, what can we get rid of, what can't we? I mean, if Russia, which is the least commoditized, least marketized society in Europe, can't just get rid of it. Something else deeper is going on. Um, and thus he initiated a series of sort of intellectual uh, proje political projects in this um, essay, which are, in a weird way, are only now beginning to bear fruit. Um, I think Mary Douglas wrote a really obnoxious introduction to the um, last translation I felt. It was, um, you know, it went on and on about there's no free gift, which is, isn't true, of course there are. Um, but um, she did make the very uh, cogent point, I thought, that um, it, the book kind of, never realizes political potential because it came out at the wrong moment. And she hypothesized that you know, the moment might actually now be coming uh, about that the, the, the arguments that he's making here are really relevant and, and actually can reach a larger audience. Um, and, and I think the greatest sign of this was actually a, um, a report put out by the Bank of England a few uh, years ago, a couple, two years now, uh, that people didn't much notice in anthropology, but I think was quite significant. Um, because one of his big themes here is getting rid of the assumption, well, two assumptions. Um, one as, is that, you know, you start with barter, that economic utilitarian transactions are somehow primordial. Um, and while it is true, as, as it's a very much a mistake to read this, uh, his argument that there's like gift economies, there's commodity economies, these are totally different things. Um, he, on the other hand, um, he's definitely arguing that the economic, uh, you know, the sort of economic textbook version, he goes right after it quite early on. Um, talking about Captain Cook, as a matter of fact, and you know, how people misinterpreted gifts as, as attempts at barter. Um, so that, that sort of, basic economic fairy tale we're all taught is wrong. And this is one of the key um, points he tries to make in the book. And then he uses that to attack social contract theory and says that, you know, the assumption that economic rationality and therefore property are primary and therefore social society itself is our means of, of, of protecting that. Whereas, you know, he's ultimately giving the most subversive blow possible to that idea by saying, actually, no, the primordial contractual relation is the agreement to completely ignore all property relations and, and nullify them. Um, but I think it's really significant that um, that argument about the myth of barter, this is, which is really the foundational idea of, of our entire social order in a certain way. It's the prime, it is like the key myth that everybody, everybody knows, everybody's been taught, no one quite knows where they got it from. But it's just a, a sort of basic common sense which under, uh, which lays the foundations for the, the very principle of economics as the sort of master discipline. Um, has kind of been blown away. This is, um, and, and it's happened, I mean I had played a part in it but I'm just channeling people like Mosin, anthropologists who've been saying this for years, and I just sort of culled the best arguments that has come out of this Mosian tradition. Other people have done a lot of work as well. And um, I, I thought, you know, there's a milestone uh, that was hit a couple years ago when the Bank of England came out a report with its sort of authoritative statement on the creation of money. It was actually very important because among other things, they announced that, um, you know, monetarism and the entire philosophical basis of Austerity is completely wrong. Uh, heterodox economics is right. Um, 
it was, it was really a bombshell. Um, but, but it also contained, you know, a little thing about the origin of money where they had these Bank of England guys saying, well, imagine you have these two primitive people and one has berries and the other has fish. And it just sounds like they're about to start the myth of barter, but they don't do it. And they say, well, they'd set up an elaborate credit system of debts and <laughs> you know, they went the other way, you know? And I remember thinking like, oh, if only I could tell most, we should summon his spirit. We won, we finally did it. <laughs> um, so. This is sure, surely a sign that something is changing. I think that what Jane's comments that, you know, we're moving into a period where the very basic economic questions that we're asking are different, um, that most is relevant. And I think that's really true. I think that, you know, once again, they're saying, what happens when they robotize away the jobs? What are we going to do? Basic income, are we going to have to, like, actually base our entire economy on, on simply giving people money? Um, at, at this moment, I mean, the sort of intellectual project, which had been foundering for almost 80 years, is finally bearing fruit. And, and, and most is, sudden, I think, more relevant than he's ever been before. I'll end on that. Thank you. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have a great thrust about them. <laughs> Bowdlerizing the Bard in this way gives you a very accurate picture of the last speaker on this panel. The driving force and inspiration behind how the Journal of Ethnographic Theory and how books, he has been waving a flag for open access since 2011. Against the prediction that how would fold within a year, he not only persevered, but made it into a flagship anthropology journal of extraordinary intellectual caliber all entirely for free, a true gift of ideas, debates, and discussions. He is House Editor-in-Chief and the Director of Publications of the Center for Ethnographic Theory. Meet the man on top of the pile, Giovanni da Col. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish to start with two provocations. So, and the two provocation in questions can be summarized as follows. So many of the social instances traditionally encompassed by anthropological inquiry within the category of gift given are rather manifestations of hosting situations and events. What if hospitality constitutes the transcendental field of value creation and relation of exchange? And the second, what does anthropological theory, do anthropological theories of gift giving, how, they, how do they speak to contemporary ideologies or gratuity in open access scholarship? So Marilyn Stratern once argued that methodology is always regional, that some regions of the world seem to provide location for the pursuit of particular problems in anthropological theory, whereas others do not. A crucial anthropological strategy can be deployed by taking invented concepts in different ethnographic, <clears throat> uh, invented concepts in different ethnographic contexts to rearrange, negate, or invert a relationship between familiar terms. The gift proved to be the egregious anthropological construct to be subject to such negative strategies. This is the case of inquiries such as Paris. Trans transposition of the Maori gift in India, who showed that the status of the Indian gift, Dana, is not predicated on an ideology of reciprocity, but rather relies on a soteriology. The gift which is returned is not a gift. Is, uh, that a subject defining relation of masterhood, I would say, also replicated linguistically on different scale, for example, the duck in Tibetan used for indicating both the householder, the spirit, and the landmaster, and the owner, the patron. The same in Ed, the Mongolian, or in other Turkic and Siberian languages. So, and this relation of mastery transcends simple expression uh, uh, and relations of ownership, authority, or domination. In this zone, which I and my colleague Adam Chow I call it completely arbitrary, a cumulus cultural zone. 
Uh, we find a surprising propensity for social practices related to hosting and hospitality, sacrifice to gain favor from a patron, host, land, or spirit master, and very subjecting and uh, concerns for accumulation, storage, hoarding, containership, and related preoccupations with leakages and parasitism. Now, Benveniste also noticed that there is an obvious connection that joins the notion of the gift and that of hospitality, and indeed hospitality emerges over and over in anthropological literature entangled with the gift as an implicit or passing reference point. So it is, as, it is then time to return to one of my previous thought experiments. Imagine what anthropology might look today if Marcel Mauss had chosen hospitality rather than the gift as a subject of his 1924 treatise. So this alternative future for anthropology could be brought into being by an alternative theoretical scenario. What if the logic of hospitality encompasses relation of sharing, giving, or trading? What if hospitality is the transcendental field of value production and transformation? It may well be that in, in most essay, hospitality does not appear, uh, appear indeed as a subcategory of the gift, but rather one of the conditions of the possibility for gift giving and forms of generalized exchange. I quote, to trade, the first condition was to lay aside a spear. From then onwards, onward society succeeding in exchanging goods and person, no longer only between clans, but between tribes and nation, and above all, between individuals. The epigraph from the Norse collection of religious poem Havamal, chosen by most to introduce the gift, is indeed concerned with reciprocity. Yet it is named Gestatur, the guest section, um, of which, uh, which comprises the rules, manner of relationship for being a guest while traveling and handling relation with horse in Norse ancient society. Indeed, for most, hospitality intertwines with gift giving as the most basic human acts for granting or relationship of alliance and affinity. I quote again, for a clan, a household, a group of people, a guest, have no option but to ask for hospitality, to receive present, to enter into trading, to contract alliances through wives and blood kinship. To refuse to give, to fail to invite, just as a refuse to accept, is tantamount to declaring war. It is to reject the bond of alliance and commonality. Yes, his last chapter contains most, most famous invitation to return to the joy of expenditure, which is also the prize of hospitality. Once again, we shall discover those modes of action still remembered by many society and classes. The joy of giving in public, the delight in generous artistic expenditure, the pleasure of hospitality in public or, or private feast. In the conclusion, most thus return to the law of hospitality as a juridical and economic institution developed in an advanced society. Quote again, until legal systems and economies evolved not far removed from our own, it is always with strangers that one deals, even if lies, right most. Pre-modern society have to rely on tribal festival and ceremonies, where peace had to be maintained by the law of friendships and contract with the gods. Is then hospitality an ideological abstraction or an institution or a more specific cognitive orientation or field for the, for the transformation of values? We had to wait until Nancy Mann's work on the value creation and transmission among the massim of Papua New Guinea for a perspective in which hospitality appears as encompassing the logic of sharing and exchange. Man's focus is how actors control the social world through transformational acts of value creation. Instead of focusing on the partition of a person achieved by gift exchange, Man highlights how a person is equally extended and dispersed by act of hospitality. Hospitality is the trans uh, uh, if read correct as, as I read it, as I read Man, is the transcendental field of value transformation which allows sharing to take place and the potency of a person to be deployed in concrete material exchanges which extend the intersubjective space-time defined by man as the space of self-other relationship form in and through acts and practices. For man, hospitality has constitute this, transcend this transcendental field where the contractions and extensions of the intersubjective space-time occur. 
Witchcraft, selfishness, and greediness subvert space time by negating and consuming one's capacity to extend and diffuse their influence, while this act of sharing food, predicated upon the framing's device of hospitality, is the, is the template of value creation which externalizes the self beyond the physical person, hence achieving control over space time. Hospitality activates the possibility of further construction of value by enabling alliances, higher level of exchange, the acquisition of cooler shells, and the value conversion of trading acts and localized influence into virtual fame. But where for, uh, as we know, as many have written before, for most gift giving ground our conceptions of sociality and relatedness, but a paradigmatic form of the gift was an extension of was, um, was the sacrificial theory deve he developed with Hubert, where a part of the person is relinquished to another being in order to elicit a reciprocation of grace, favors, substance, spirit, or body. As it is a field of participation, hospitality is the, also the ideal field for sacrificial action. This is certainly not unheard. For the Tien, every feast in ancient Greece was a sacrificial moment. Feasting in other tradition is a way of reclassifying and eating what may otherwise not be eaten to make available for human consumption what cannot otherwise be consumed. But the ability to give and still keep also as a special, as a special position that the Lord of the state or a patron of a sacrifice or a wealthy host enjoys is generosity being not a sort uh, or in an investment designed to bring return by an expression of the sort of permanent inalienable wealth he already has, titled to land, status, and fame. This is an eight Wiener's attempt to displace the motion justification of exchange in an ideology of reciprocity by showing that possession of certain things can never be relinquished as gifts. It is to the paradox of retaining things and that with high value or mana while other goods are exchanged, that the status of the donor is increased and his relationship with the gods maintained. As I earlier argued, it is the capacity to control the leakage of fortunate energy during hospitality events which preserve the Tibetan household internal productive sources of prosperity and the capacity to redistribute external wealth. For Wiener, Malinowski's cooler exchange cannot be justified by an ideology of reciprocity. She rather suggests that the accumulation of cooler cells, which will later become an, an, an inalienable possession, resemble the prize wealth acquired in ancient Greeks. But she, to describe this uh, form of ancient Greek social form, he used, she used the word senia, which is the Greek form of guest ritualized friendship. So we can see for ex uh, that, uh, and, and we can notice in um, in Wiener how the retention, the the, the objects retained, which uh, become also inalienable, are also the ones which constitute the condition for hospitality, and uh, and generate for the fame for the host and the household of the host, or a quoting. Um, I quote from Wiener, just as the feudal lords, through their authority vested in, in their estates, attracted merchants, peasants, and monks. So, from, so talking about hospitality and this, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the relation between, hosp between hospitality and the gifts brings me to a final point, a brief final point I want to make. So each, each year, from December 13 to January 6, my daughter has three kind of what I call cosmo-economic encounters. One is called Santa Lucia, one is called, of course, Santa Claus, and one is called La Befana. The first two figures incarnate that mysterious human phenomenon that Gerson called, which is cited by most in his essay, families promoted a silent trade, that is, the exchange of goods between two parties who will never meet face to face never communicate directly, never discuss the nature of the trade. Santa Lucia will expect a sweet carrying donkey to be fed with yellow polenta flour and a glass of milk left on the balcony. 
Santa Claus will enjoy some cookies near the Christmas tree. American children may add milk and carrots for the reindeers, while British children may, may lay out some mince pies and sherry. <laughs> Befana is an old woman witch who rides a broom and enters houses to fill thick woolen stockings, with children leave hanging about the fireplace with either candies if they have been good during the previous year, or coal if they have been naughty. All these clandestine happenings represent not just silent trade, but what uh, David Graeber called ingeniously gift by stealth, a kind of reverse burglary where the donor forces himself into the recipient's house to leave a gift. In his radical form, like with Befana, with Befana the profit of the gift by stealth is that no counter gift is expected and sometimes the donor can be neither identified nor thanked. Now, this is a condition that as open access editor I felt very much <laughs> the question of pure and fair gift has been fairly debated in anthropology, especially by Paris articles, which make clear that the whole ideology of pureness is just our invention. Carry to, as I said, ideologies of pure gift accompany the rise of industrial capitalism. The dilemma does not affect the gift per se, but rather our ideology of gratuity. In most society, a gift is never really free, although we did develop a theory of how it should be free. Now, that is not really preposterous to say that the association of open access with the free gift, that how also used for at the beginning, is a gimmick too. A theory of gratuity that we use quite effectively. There are few doubts that the whole discourse of gratuity affecting academic publishing may be an ideological side effect of an increased corporatization of academia and the obscene profit of commercial, pu of commercial publisher rather than a reality into itself. So I want to leave you with this reflection. So how can we analyze the social life of open access ethnographically and through the corpus of anthropological theories of gifts? How and why open access should be free? How how it should be sustained, and, uh, and whether it's precisely, in a sense, the freedom and the facility of access that may owe us an influence of the value of the publication, in a sense that if we want to think, for example, with uh, Zimmel and, uh, and Alfred Gell, more resistance, in a sense, to reach a certain desired object, more the value is increased, and that is also, I mean, the value of the object increased, and then maybe, that could be also a reason why open access also has a limit. So I wanted to conclude with this and ask you uh, with, with these two provocations, which I think have been somehow uh, coming out, one from my field, one from my experience as editor, which is a field within itself. And thank you very much for, for this. And uh, if you have to, uh, if I had to conclude with a, uh, with, with a sentence actually, I would conclude that, uh, how is paid by as much would say by the counterfeit coin of its dreams. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, <laughs> Your translator. <laughs> my translator, thank you. Um, my criticism is that the, tra the transactions are, always, are, are often very specific. They don't involve uh, necessarily exchange of marital uh, spouses. They don't involve necessarily exchanges of uh, respects uh, particularly. Uh, they might have all kinds of, there are all kinds of exchanges which are, uh, which are uh, quite reciprocal but without uh, these larger implications. Hmm. Most wanted to leave out all of these things he called sharing, for example. Sh sharing, he said, is not reciprocal. Well, it, of course it is in the, in the long run of, uh, of time, uh, or it tends to be. Uh, he also was imprecise in uh, when he talked about the potlatch, uh, the Kula as a potlatch, because uh, the people who are going to Kula are competing with each other for the valuable. So their partner. Well, it's of course totally different from the uh, the op the opposition between chiefs and a potlatch in in the uh, northwest coast. Uh, so there there are a lot of these things that I head scratchers when you read the book. I I, mm. I, I have found especially recently when I when I uh, read this great translation. Uh, I wondered about uh, the the. Uh, accuracy of all the, 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 the way he's re writing. He calls also Potlatch, uh, the, uh, the, he calls uh, Potlatch the, the Trobriander's chief's redistribution of goods. I, I <laughs> doesn't seem to be correct. Mm. Yeah, I, I think actually um, Johnny Perry uh, did a quite lucid analysis of, of, of there's an implicit evolutionism where you start with total prestation and then it kind of goes to potlatch as the next stage and um, then to commodities lying underneath the text but he never actually is, is entirely clear which he's using when and how it works. Um, I mean the one thing I'd add you know you have moieties uh, the other example he gives is when two clans sort of meet each other and there's a choice of either to go to war or give everything to each other I think that the biggest examples of a total prestation that you actually have are in accounts of explorers often uh, Columbus or, or, or Cook um, you know we meet people and they're like okay do we kill these guys do we hide or do we just meet them on the beach and then sort of people do give everything to each other uh, and, and it's often you can tell the accounts are very amusing because Columbus in particular never figured out what was going on. So one day he's writing, these people are the best people in the world. They just give you everything. You know, They show up, they give you their women, their pigs. Their, um, and then the next day it's like, these people are all thieves. I can't believe it. They just take anything they want. You know, it, uh, that's total prestation, but it's a very, very specific thing that happens under very specific circumstances where you have to lay the ground for everything else. I think also we, we uh we owe a great debt to Jane about the war, the war pro issue in the book. Mm. Uh, when I first read it, I understood it as a, uh, a very common sort of uh, implicit Hobbesianism in mm. our thinking about society. Uh, it's certainly true in Britain uh, where all the juridical notions had to be brought to bear uh, <coughs> in order to uh, as it were, uh, prevent the war of each against all. Even matrilineal or patrilineal descent, uh, rights in persons divided so that uh, people didn't fight over persons, according to Radcliffe Brown. Um, all, all kinds of sort of sub rosa ideas of an underlying Hobbesian state. And when I first read The Gift, it struck me as he was, he was also arguing against this. I mean, you have a choice, he said, either you're going to exchange or you will fight or, uh, or, take, or disappear from each other's view. Uh, and this was so much like Hobbes' description of the state of nature. Um, but on the other hand, I now realize from Jane's translation, from the wonderful contextualization that's involved by putting the memorial speeches, uh, the memorial tributes, sorry, to his fallen comrades, how much the war has 
influenced his no his his desire to produce a con a contractual amity uh, amity between between peoples uh, and uh, and and you know the, the the attempt to make peace loyalty uh, integrate uh, well, opposing parties has to be very meaningful in the terms of the First World War uh, and its casualties. So uh, I think it could still possibly be true that the Hobbesian underlying state is a premise of our anthropology. I think it has been a largely a premise, certainly in Britain. Uh, and all this emphasis on contract and juridical uh, a a means of preventing uh, arguments, violence, contests over goods or persons uh, implies uh, a situation like Tyler's, even our notion of incest. That we had, uh, if the Tylorian theory was correct, you, know, you had a choice of dying out or, or, uh, or bonding together. As if if you didn't have uh, exogamy and, and relations between people, you were gonna fight. Uh, so there was, a, and there still is, I think, some sort of uh, deep Hobbesianism, but, but certainly in this case it was uh, perhaps even overcome, overshadowed, or encompassed uh, by the tragedy of World War I and the necessity of his time, our time, of, uh, of a peaceful coexistence by means of exchange. Thank you. Can we actually ask to uh, uh, Professor Jengai, would you like to join us on stage? I think you should be up here. Um, there is an added chair, and I'm sure there may be questions as to the particular work of translation. Sure, maybe I should go over there, please. I wish you get some mic too. Anybody want to take that? Or? Yeah, it's also true that, that Moses had a very unusual idea of evolutionism, whereby he felt that the only people who were actually primitive were Australians, um, and everybody else weren't. Um, uh, so he often used the word archaic as a stand-in. Um, this is owing to his sort of hyper-diffusionist theories, where he felt that like everybody was in contact with everybody else, and what's to understand is not how influences traveled, but why occasionally they were refused. Uh, he was convinced, for example, with the Pacific Ocean, that people were just sailing across it all the time, and the Kwakutl were heavily influenced by China, and vice versa, and so forth, and so on. So those are all archaic. Archaic was a word he used to substitute for primitive when he didn't think it was appropriate if people were into living in isolation, which he thought only Australians actually were. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just uh, add to that and thank uh, Keith for uh, the illumination of what most might have meant. 
um, but I've translated, of course, into our contemporary elephant in the room, uh, which is what we've created through um, what you would call 150 years of ethnography and what we do with that. But thank you very much for the, <laughs> for the classical references. Yeah, I, I think in, uh, one of the great things about re reproducing this book about 150 years of ethnography, I complain all the time about my own university that we are now ignoring 150 years of, of uh, ethnography. We who are the custodians of this knowledge about humankind mm -hmm. are not teaching it. Uh, and it's going absolutely uh, into the way d dustbin of history uh, because of our lack of curiosity about this ethnography. I think it's very timely that the book came out, a new edition came out, and I hope it has a great effect. My fear is that uh, this ethnography that we've been doing for 150 years will be lost for several centuries. <laughs> Until somebody finds it again, we'll have a renaissance <laughs> as good as the one that <laughs> happened when they discovered the Greek and Roman classics. <laughs> well, I, I might uh, just add, uh, Keith, to your inclusion here of Archaic, that some of Moses' examples are the peoples of France, the peoples of Europe, the, the, the peoples who are still living in the countryside, side, still creating life in rural Europe. Uh, so archaic in that broad sense that you're indicating, it does include in this, this way that is original to him, I think, at the time, the highly literate records that we have of Greece and Rome and in Sanskrit and in Hebrew and so on and so forth, but also the peasantry of Europe and the, the, the ethics and the Jessup expedition and so on and so forth, all put together in, this, in one big category of well, a reservoir, really, of inspiration together, not as separate evolutionary stages, but as, a, as a, an archive. <coughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Let's talk about something else now. <laughs> the first peace fight will start soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Tresh, University of Pennsylvania. And I actually don't want to change the subject because I thought the comments about the awkward archaic uh, were very provocative and the choice of Professor Geyer to keep that in the translation. And I wonder, rather, beyond the kind of philological debate about um, archaism's roots in philology, which we've just been having, I wonder if there's a chance here with this republication and with all of you uh, uh, in front of us um, to think about maybe reclaiming that awkward archaism kind of explicitly? Is, is this a sense, um, is, is this a moment perhaps to rethink and reframe the, the discipline against the insistence on coevalness, on the present, on the, the, the constant looking to what's going on and the contemporary as the definition of the proper field of application of anthropology? And does this discussion about Mose and this rereading of Mose and rereading of the archive that Mose uh, 
uh, mobilizes, um, create the possibility to you know, rethink archaism, a deliberate archaism, which isn't the return to primitivism or the primitivism that is so much more awkward and so much more properly dismissed. Is there a possible uh, deliberate and conscious return to archaism that would be perhaps the most contemporary and most forward-looking move that could happen in the field right now? Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> but it would be a brave. <laughs> that would be a brave world indeed. Um, the um, impetus, of course, behind the stress on coeval carries with it a whole political baggage to do with uh, contemporary issues, inequality, and so forth. One would have it would be quite an up, quite an uphill struggle. But uh, yes, a resounding yes. But since you chimed in. Over to you, Jane. <laughs> well, no, I, I, th I think it, I'm on the same page as, as, as you with respect to this, Marilyn, that, that I mean, this is um, our field in anthropology is the human experience. Wherever, whenever, uh, as uh, expressed by the people themselves in their own words. Uh, this is an, an immensely rich archive on which to draw, uh, just as Marshall has been suggesting that this is not just the present present, that is 2016. This is people living in their present and the ways in which they have been doing that. And most does say explicitly that this is a, a source of wisdom on which we could draw so that we don't go on massacring each other the way we have just done. That it has that potential. And perhaps I could just add a further, a further, a further footnote. Mm. Um, uh, under the rubric of um, coevalness, which of course, I mean, you know, like uh, like all, all, all such all such propositions are not, not only very powerful, but there's a lot there's a lot to want, want to support. And there's something else, which is the demand that we can only like people if they're like us. And I think there's a real political issue to do with the way we think about people who are not like us, and actually able to say that, and that and that, and making that a basis. Uh, from which one uh, one proceeds. Yeah, it's not as if this uh, material didn't have present relevance. I think that's what's fundamental too. I mean, we're not just going to talk about the archaic societies in archaic terms. It is, uh, it is a fact that uh, the cultural differences that exist in the world are still operative even within, uh, and are extremely important even within the global system that we live. So I think the, it's not a question of either or, it's a question of putting them together. And for that, of course, we do need to study the older ones because we, we aren't doing it anymore. And in all, you know, the, the idea you started with, I mean, the statement you started with, people only studying their contemporary situation, well, 40 years from now, nobody will be paying any attention to what they're doing. They should take that into consideration. <laughs> mm. Thank you, David Wengrove from UCL. Just to pick up on a comment uh, of Dame Marilyn's, I think there are two elephants in the room, uh, the ethnographic record and the archeological record. Moss was, um, was fascinated by archeology span uh, as it was at the time. And in that nice collection of his essays that Nathan Schlanger uh, put together, he's already picked up on these little shreds of evidence of Paleolithic peoples moving bits of red ochre, bits of minerals over extraordinary distances. 
And you can't help thinking if he was around today, uh, he would be talking to archaeologists because these questions about archaic societies are properly archaeological questions to which there are these days uh, actually answers uh, emerging. But I don't think we'd have the first clue uh, how to frame those answers were it not for the ethnographic record and the range of, uh, of human behaviors that it attests to, which we would otherwise consider simply ridiculous uh, or impossible. Um, so I wonder if we need to define anthropology uh, a bit more broadly. Uh, and I would apply that also to Professor Salin's lecture yesterday, which in many ways deals with properly archaeological questions. Hmm. My experience is that it's the archaeologists who are the best anthropologists, unfortunately. <laughs> In the United States, that is, not here. Mm. Partly because they have no choice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Faces. <laughs> we dare not say anything. Yes, please, over there. <laughs> John Campbell Soez. Um, th thank you for your, your contributions <clears throat> and for the book, which I look forward to reading and renewing my, uh, my knowledge of anthropology's foundations. Um, but I want to, in a sense, I'm, I'm reflecting an earlier question to two persons before me. And that is to, to reflect on the relevance of most today and the issue of exchange and the importance of social relationships, which current states, current forms of governance tend to ignore. And I, I wonder if I could ask the panel to, to discuss, at least in general terms, what they think um, most an understanding uh, from World War I and the contributions and the meta-humans, which he was dealing with, uh, to paraphrase um, Marshall Solon's last night, um, would, uh, would speak to you today in contemporary terms? Uh, yes, I would say something very briefly on the relationship between um, self-interest and other interest. Um, I think there are numerous uh, contexts, not least the organ donation situation that I referred to very briefly, where issues to do with kinship and so forth arise and we simply do not know how to deal with the interested nature of, say, kin relations in that kind of context where the international community has seized this word altruism and cannot conceive the way in which altruism is, is modified with um, interested relations in the kinship context. That's a very obvious one, but I think um, most is actually extremely helpful there. Well, this is a very large question to put your own mind in the mind of somebody from 90 years ago. Um, but I think that the, the encouragement that we would get from his work would be to be deeply attentive to the details of transactions that people think of under rubrics that we might define or they would define as gift and how they actually work. We had this wonderful example, didn't we, of the books arriving and, and where well, is that a gift? You know, well, <laughs> if it's a gift, then what about, what about taxes? What about, uh, is there, I had in my mind immediately, ah, uh, these people have got marijuana packed into these boxes <laughs> <laughs> or something else. Uh, but the, 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 the current ways in which these terminologies are deployed, I think would be the, um, the grounding that we would need to be standing on and searching from uh, to be in the spirit of most at that time. 
So as I mentioned at the end of my talk this very morning, this, this, this message about the, the future of, uh, of the next industrial revolution, mm. robotics and genomics and, uh, and, and everything is going to be uh, rejigged. And I wrote it down somewhere. But we could be attentive, ethnographically attentive to what are the words here? What are the concepts? Are people creating new concepts for this world? Are robots going to exchange things with each other? Uh, what are they going to exchange? They're going to have hands to exchange with. They're going to have ears to listen to each other. In a, some deeply tangible sense, we would be following most if we were checking out exactly what this implied for the present. Thank you very much. I think we'll take a break, 30 minutes. We'll reconvene 10 to 5. Please come back um, afterwards. And thank you very much for our panelists.